And since we've seen universities and colleges become increasingly financially dependent on tuition fee income, we've also seen university management attempting to fill their funding gaps by increasing student recruitment, building campus facilities students now can't access, and locking students into accommodation contracts they can't escape. Now we see that student and staff health and welfare is at risk, working conditions for frontline staff are unsafe and rising numbers of students are facing financial struggle while others can't access their education. But how did we get here? So it's been almost 10 years to the, to the day that students across the country came together to protest the introduction of higher tuition fees and the impact of that policy is being felt by students across the country. And as I said, we're so excited to have Marissa uh, join us today. Uh, she's the current president of the National Union of Students. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, how we've got to this point um, and how we fight back against it as well. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Marissa uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we will be asking your questions. So if you can send questions to me um, and I will collect them all and then we will be posing them to Larissa afterwards. So over to you, Larissa. Thank you so much for that intro, Jane, and thanks for having me. Um, I mean, COVID, capitalism and crisis in HT, what a title, where to start? Um, I think let's start at the beginning, right? COVID. So the coronavirus pandemic has spawned a global crisis, as we all know, of immense scale that's hitting us on multiple interconnected fronts. It's exacerbating the pre-existing issues sown in the very fabric of our society, but also blindsiding us with new ones that continue to arise. And, you know, as we know, hundreds of thousands of people around the world have lost their lives to this virus. Those have lost their lives are our loved ones, they're our colleagues, members of our student movement, healthcare and key workers, and every single one of their deaths is a tragedy. And we just mustn't forget that so many were pre preventable. And I say that because this crisis is political. Uh, and so before we start to get into, you know, the, the impacts directly on students, directly on our movement, directly on the things that we're talking about, I also want to dwell a bit for a minute on the fact that the, the human cost of coronavirus hasn't fallen equally. Um, with disabled working class, black and brown communities, and particularly those who exist at their intersections, bearing the brunt of a government who sees so many of us as disposable. Um, and over the past few months, we've also really seen highlighted the ways that the impacts of coronavirus have interwoven with the pre-existing global pandemic of racism and anti-blackness um, that has plagued our societies long before 2020. And so on top of the racialized violence of the virus, We've also had to yet again mourn and demand justice for victims of anti-Black police brutality, some whose names we know, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, but so many whose names we don't. And of course, we say again as a movement, Black Lives Matter. But this again was exhausting because meanwhile, we saw universities who are yet to reckon with the fact that their institutions are the very product of historical genocide, enslavement, displacement and colonialism, all acting brand new and putting up black squares and empty platitudes only to now have moved on. So the context for all of this is quite harrowing. The unequal impact of the virus on oppressed communities is yet another product of the last 10 years of destructive austerity of the failed privatization and undermining of our public services or the undervaluing of key workers' lives. And as we enter yet another deep recession, it seems the government is responding as it always does, bailing out landlords, not tenants, bailing out corporate tax is not the ordinary taxpayers and it's bailed out the global polluters whilst paying lip service to a green new deal that if truly implemented could save lives livelihoods on our planet and you know i've joked with quite a few a few folks in the movement that as we awaited the government's policy response uh, to these systemic crises that lay before us a couple of months ago it turned out that their flagship their flagship solution was cheap nandos um, and I say all of this to say that in the midst of such chaos, it can be really difficult to find positivity, to find opportunity, to find hope. Um, but this is a reminder that those who live before us in similar circumstances always did. Because for those of you who don't know, um, NUS, so the National Union of Students, was founded actually in 1922 in the aftermath of the chaos and destruction of World War I. And people often also forget um, a global influenza pandemic that accompanied the armistice and took more lives than the war itself. So as we collectively lead the student movement into its centenary in eerily familiar circumstances to when it was founded, 
I think we have to harness the same hope, the same drive for something better that our founders did. We have to be radical to be visionary and build a grassroots mass movement that's capable of realizing those radical visions so that we can create a new world from the rubble of the old. But I guess that lends itself to the question, what does it mean to be radical at a time like this? Um, and I ask myself this a lot, and it constantly draws me back to the words of Angela Davis, who said that radical simply means grasping things at the root. Um, and too often, and especially at times like these, you know, when so much is going on, it's easy to get caught up and to be left fighting the weeds of injustice that spring up quicker than we can cut them down. Literally everything that we're seeing in this moment and, and likely the things that you're experiencing as students are weeds. And by that, I mean symptoms of what's rotting under the surface. So, you know, the, these things, these experiences, these, decis these decisions universities are making, they aren't just the result of a few bad decisions. They're just the latest manifestation of the tyranny of the marketized university, which is forced to prioritize profits literally above all else. It's the built-in instability, the reliance on extorting students for fees, the fact that many of these multi-million pound institutions are mega landlords charging extortionate rents that led to students being lied to about what was safely possible this term. It's the creeping rise of hyper-surveillance on campuses that meant university managers thought having security guards with dogs patrolling campuses and student lockdowns was normal and not dystopian. So I guess continuing on the dreadful gardening metaphor, um, I see the student movement's role and the role of the Students Deserve Better campaign that NUS is running in this moment as redressing those tangible things that students are facing. And so we are fighting for um, basic legal rights to be upheld so that no student is held to different rules than the rest of the public. We are fighting for the right for students to leave their, leave their course, to leave their accommodation without financial detriment. We are fighting for fair treatment in lockdowns with, from rent rebates to free care packages um, to targeted educational and wellbeing support. And we are fighting for an effective strategy right now uh, to build the, the mass testing, uh, the move to online teaching, the, the Im immediate uh, financial support, the digital infrastructure, the mental health support we need. But we're not only fighting for the now, we're also fighting for a future lens on this strategy for education to build a new vision for education that actually delivers for everyone in society. And so we're also talking about how we build, we create the spaces for political education that provide the language, the roadmap, the context that allows students to grasp at the roots of these issues. Roots which stem in the corporatized, centralized, hierarchized management of the marketized university within the neoliberal framework. And which also gives students the space to dream so that once we uproot, we can build a new towards fully funded, lifelong, truly accessible, democratized and liberated education. And our second national campaign that's running is all around decolonizing education and looking at it through that lens of liberation. And I'd really encourage you to get involved in that too, but I don't really have the space to talk about that at length here. So I guess I say all of this to say, we will continue at NUS to weaponize what tools available to us to enable the work at the grassroots so that we can collectively mobilize a mass movement of students, a movement powerful enough to cut through the noise so that we can actually win for students, but also build a better world. So I guess that, that lends me to talk a bit about how we're building. Um, and we've done a couple of days of action already, uh, but now we're gearing up for the next. Uh, which is happening on Tuesday, uh, where we're hosting town halls up and down the country across the four nations of the UK, uh, so that we can hold MPs, vice chancellors and all decision makers to account. Across the country, different students have been inviting those decision makers into spaces where students can hold their feet to the fire, can interrogate them, can ask them questions about how we've ended up here, why they've allowed it to happen and what we're gonna do about it. And I'm really excited to start flipping that power narrative because so often in the marketized university, students are treated so passively. We're treated as recipients of education, people who should sit down, shut up and listen. But actually this is about us reclaiming these spaces, using our voices to actively shape education, to position students as agents of change, people who can hold those decision makers to account, people who sh should do that 
And so I'm really excited to do that. And if you want to get involved, do let me know. I hope to get into it in the Q&A and beyond that. So this is exciting um, because, you know, NUS planned this day of action, but then a bunch of activists, because organisers have been at it on the ground. They've been active. We've seen it from the rent strikes in Bristol, in Manchester, in Edinburgh, all literally all over. Um, and so students came to me and they were like, look, we want to turn the day of action into a week of action. So there's actually more going on than we ever would have planned. Uh, on Monday, there's a bunch of political education materials that are going to be shared from across the country, um, from organisations like Pause or Pay UK, who look specifically at the role um, of art students can play um, in this liberatory work and really thinking about uh, the ways that art students have been disenfranchised um, and, and really um, the way that art students have been treated throughout this pandemic. Uh, to uh, spaces like Liberate the University um, who've really been um, thinking about how students at the grassroots can be talking about uh, the work of liberation which is so exciting um, to unis resist border controls who've been really looking at uh, migrant students uh, and migrant academics coming together uh, to resist hyper surveillance uh, and all of the ways that universities are complicit um, in the hostile environment. Uh, and so all folks across the movement want to share the political education resources that they have on a Monday. Of course, as I mentioned, we've got the town halls on a Tuesday happening up and down the country. Uh, Wednesday is a rest day. But Thursday, there's going to be banner drops across the country. Uh, so look out. And then on Friday, we're looking to host a telethon bringing together um, students at the grassroots who've really been bearing the brunt uh, of the ways that this crisis has exposed and exacerbated um, you know the, the fundamental flaws in the, the marketized university and how that's really evolved particularly in spaces like Bristol and Manchester where they've seen grassroots action really changing the tide on this uh, but also hopefully pulling in um, a few folks um, who are allies to our movement and can support us too. So this next week is going to be popping off. Check everything out. Um, it will all be on the Students Deserve Better hashtag. Um, and really, really, really hope you get involved. Um, and I guess the, the last thing that I really want to leave with, because as I, I think uh, I said earlier, like, I really want this to be more of a discussion. And I don't want to talk at you for too long. Um, so the, the kind of last thing I, I do want to mention is that in this moment, it, we really are living through what campaign theorists call the moment of the whirlwind, which is a time of crisis that spawns opportunities for mass social change. And I hope, in fact, I know that our movement is powerful enough to seize those opportunities. And through the whirlwind, I think that we can see the glimmer of a new future. Um, and you know, I know that another world is not only possible, Sis is well on her way. Um, and on some of these quiet days in lockdown, not so quiet today, I don't know if anyone's noticed the news of what's happening, but anyway, on some of the quieter days in lockdown, um, one pattern has been really, really loud and clear. I've seen friends who usually shrug up politics turning up to protests, family members who don't usually want to discuss what's going on, talking about reimagining justice, reimagining education, people on social media who I just wouldn't expect to, critiquing the government's response to the pandemic. And so in each of those moments, I could almost hear that whirlwind building and knocking at power's door. Um, so let's keep knocking uh, and see where it takes us. Uh, and I'm really, really excited um, to hopefully see lots of you folks involved in the work that we're doing um, to build that movement, um, but also to see how we can complement one another, because I know there's so much alignment in what we're seeking to do. Um, so I guess in sum, we are really, really hoping um, to see this moment and the, the things that we're tackling in the here and now as a route really to build a new vision for education, one that's fully funded, lifelong, truly accessible, democratised and liberated, and we're not going to stop going until we get there. Thanks for listening. Amazing. Thank you so much, Larissa. Um, I feel like I should be clapping as well um, because I feel so inspired after hearing you talk. Um, and I fully relate to so much that you've said. Um, the, the education system, um, I work in it myself, for those of you that don't know, um, is got so many inequalities and injustices going uh, on in it at the moment. Um, and there is such, such an opportunity here. Um, and it's so amazing to see that the work that the NUS is doing um, and student activists across 
across the country um, and the globe as well um, to try and improve it um, and to, to make it kind of this this vision of what education should and probably could be um, if we you know if our leaders have the courage to grasp that um, and to move forward um, so we've had a couple of questions come in um, so I'm just going to start so you kind of touched on on the fact that today was a whirlwind of a day, um, which I think we we all know a little bit um, from kind of looking at things on Twitter and, and on the news uh, with the new testing um, system being announced and with students having this kind of six day period to go home, um, which I know from my perspective, I, I definitely I read that um, the guidance that was published and kind of went, oh, my goodness, another one, uh, something that's not particularly helpful. Um, and I know that you've probably been dealing this, with this from your side as well. Uh, so I was just wondering, what are your kind of your thoughts on that, on the government support um, and particularly um, on students returning home and being able to get home for Christmas? Um, yeah, I mean, before I jump in, just thank you for all the kind words in the chat. Um, but then in relation to the question, so it's weird, you know, been calling for mass asymptomatic testing since September, publicly since, you know, before that behind closed doors as well, um, in our meetings with ministers, etc. And so in some ways, you know, I've got to take my wins where they come. And I, I was like, let me just celebrate for a hot second because I'm exhausted <laughs> and we're exhausted and the movement's exhausted. So for a second, I was like, oh, mass asymptomatic testing. OK, that's great. Um, and in the, in the next second, I was like, okay, let's get into it now. Um, what does this actually mean for students? Because if we're seeing everyone, and this is over a million students pushed into a six day window, what's that gonna do to travel prices? Um, and we've seen the fact um, that, you know, of a lot of students who ordinarily would have to work part-time to make ends meet, just haven't been able to find those part-time jobs, be it in retail, in leisure and hospitality because of the recession, right? So students are already at the brink financially in many cases. If we're seeing um, a kind of rise in the prices of, of travel um, and people, are, that means that some people aren't gonna be able to afford to go, to go home. So I think we really need to think like long and hard about how we push this government to make some commitments around you know travel prices and making sure that every student ha can afford to get home and can get home right um but i also think we need to think about what this means in, in terms of online learning because they're saying that anyone who's got stuff to do post um the ninth um or like the the slot that you're given in in england at least um, to go home is then gonna have to learn online I just did it on purpose to make my point or no I didn't do that um we'll, we'll, we'll cool sorry I don't know how much of the answer you heard or if you want me to jump back into that or if we should move to the next question up to you you're welcome to jump back into that um I think we we got up to digital poverty uh, <laughs> and then the right, internet yeah. very reliably cut out <laughs> Yeah, no, I just, yeah, I'm really talking about the, the digital divides um, on, on class lines, but also talking about um, assistive technologies for disabled students um, and the fact that, you know, some people need to, the things that they would ordinarily access on campus or at uni, but now they're going to have to move home earlier than intended. Uh, and when people have work to do over the, over the um, end of term break, over the Christmas period, etc., um, what does that mean for those students as well? Um, so yeah, we have a number of concerns about um, this proposal. It would have been nice for the university's minister to actually speak to us before doing this, but of course she pushed, up, pushed our meeting back um, purposely so that we wouldn't be able to put these concerns to her. Um, but we move, we're meeting for her later this week. Um, no, sorry, next week, so I will drag her then. Amazing. Um, I, there's been a lot of dragging of the university's minister on Twitter at the moment. Um, I've been resisting the urge, I must say. Uh, it's very, very tempting. Um, <laughs> it's so tempting. I'm not saying she drives me nuts, but she she, she does. Um, and I say that as she is a York grad and I'm currently at York. Um, so apologies for her education. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to move on. Um, so we've had a, kind of a couple of questions around the, the testing programme. Um, and obviously this is, this is new. This is something that universities are kind of buying into. It's asymptomatic testing um, and it, it is voluntary as well. Um, so one of the things obviously with testing is that you test positive and you have to self-isolate um, and a lot of students have already done that this 
this term they've done it once or twice and we're now you know in lockdown as well um and i can't imagine what it must be like to to go through four weeks of of another lockdown get tested and then have to isolate for another two weeks um it must be you know so horrendous especially when you want to you want to go home to see your family um so what type of support is is the nus calling for um and what type of support do you think students really really need throughout that period yeah i think that's a great question this is a key concern for us as well and you know thinking about the not only obviously the, the implications for people's physical health of course they need access to medicine etc um, but also um, people's uh, mental health and what is the experience um, that people have had over the past um, couple of months where many people have been, many students in fact have been yo-yoing in and out of um, lockdowns and there's just been so much uncertainty um, and, and you know I, I particularly feel for, actually no not particularly, I think it's school students have had it hard but in, in, in a lot of cases I've been talking about how for first years uh, lots of them who have moved for the first time to live independently, then they're with people they don't even know. Um, and then they're in and out of lockdown. Uh, and in some cases, not able to build those relationships um, that make them feel safe and comfortable in their home environment, only then to look outside the door, see fences being put up or seeing security guards patrolling with dogs. They're just There's so many things that have been piled on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other that have made the implications um, that are compounding the existing student mental health crisis even worse. Um, and so it is a real concern for us. And you know, the government keeps pointing us towards um, the Student Mind Student Space Hub, which of course was necessary. Um, but you know, when we talked about um, a wraparound approach to student mental health, we didn't mean a blog and a website. Like that's just not, that's not gonna cut it. I'm so sorry. Um, so, you know, we we really are talking about like how do we how do we you know resist the the, the cuts to to the NHS provision? How do we make sure uh, that universities are uh, encouraged to be up in their prov provision and incentivized to up their provision? Um, and you know, what does that look like in a systemic way? Because um, this this is not a new issue. Like we know, the student mental health crisis is an existing issue. It of course has been added to by coronavirus and added to by the student lockdowns. Um, but this is not something we're going to get out of um, with a quick fix, fix or um, some sort of uh, piecemeal reform. We need to actually be looking at what it means to have universities as spaces that centre the care not only of students but also of staff and their surrounding communities. Um, and, and at present, I just don't feel the institutions, the universities as we know them or as they are, are able to actually do that. Yeah, that's oh, that's such a good answer, Larissa. Um, and it's the, the the whole student mental health crisis really. It so much ties in with with everything going on. And it's as you said, it's such it's just not a new thing. Um, and it's something that has, you know, been building and it's, it's not, it's not in students, it's in staff as well. Um, I, I work very closely with postgrads at my university, they're really suffering, I work very closely with, with staff as well and everyone is struggling so much. Um, and it's, it's so difficult, um, everyone's doing it amazingly, but it's, it, it, it drains on you, doesn't it? I know you must be feeling this as a, as a, as a student representative at this time, it's so incredibly draining. Um, so I'm just going to ask one last question um, on kind of the, the the stuff that's come out today, because uh, there's been a lot going on um, and there are some other things I want to touch on um, as well. Um, there's so much I could literally sit and talk to you for like two hours, or so, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so uh, the, the kind of the last thing I want to ask is about next term. Um, and obviously today we, we've had this this guidance about students going home, but then if they've gone home, they've got to come back but should they be coming back should they be coming back next term and if they are what needs to happen for for them to be able to return so i think first and foremost we need to be thinking about term two before people leave because if people are leaving not to come back they need to like just logistically they need to take things with them right like there's like it's these basic things that we have to tell universities ministers and they're like oh gosh what um which is ridiculous in and of itself um so you know at a very basic level we need to know what's happening with term two before people are instructed to up and leave and given these slots or whatever the the situation is across the nations um to uh, to make sure that people have a clarity on whether they're coming back 
And in terms of if, if people should come back, you know, students continually ask me this, and you know, I I can't be a, an arbiter of, of what people do. I'm not a public health official. Um, I'm not going to parade as one. I do speak a lot to the indie sage folks um, who are kind enough to give me their time and, and answer all of my millions of questions. Um, but I'm not a public health official. I don't know um, what situation we're going to be in um, by January and whether it's going to be safe for people to come back. But I think the fact that people are legitimately questioning um whether what, what the point in coming back is when people now know that they would like to about the possibility of real face-to-face -face teaching you know i'm hearing from folks who um you know they've got the vast majority of things online and then what like for contact hours just so that the university uh, can cover their backs when students try to say I didn't get any face to face and they can say well we offered you four hours um, so it really is just this really farcical approach that lots of universities are taking it's so self-evident that this is all about protecting um, their own income and so when students are saying what's the point in me coming back you know I'm finding it very hard to to make the case for them to do so um, but equally, as, as I was saying before, for those students for whom digital poverty is a reality, for whom um, the access to um, those resources on campus is absolutely essential, then we need to be thinking about how we safely get them back as well. So, you know, this, this is all quite frustrating because lots of the discussions we're now having to have about term two are things that we tried to raise with government over the summer, where we were saying, you know, if we think about a model, a different model for universities this year, um, where we're creating hubs in co local communities, so that, for example, even if you're studying, even if you're from the south, but you're going to uni up north, you can access resources at a university that's actually close to you if you don't want to move, um, things like that, where we're being innovative about how we deliver university, how we make sure that everyone has access to the resources that they need, um, which just are so difficult to do within a context where you have a marketized higher education system, because universities are all about competition rather than collaboration. And this is not the kind of thing that we've seen across Europe. In different countries across Europe, we did not see this crisis where people moved halfway across the country and struggled to, you know, with rising coronavirus, coronavirus cases, etc., it just didn't happen um, because where these systems aren't set up in this way, um, this, this just wasn't a question. It wasn't. It wasn't like a oh, should we do it? Are we going to compromise our income? Blah blah blah. It was just like let's do what's best for public health, right? Um, so it's. It's, yeah, it is really infuriating that we're again having to put forward the case and it feels again that we're going to be ignored because of, of the underpinnings of this system. Um, so I think what needs to be done, which I doubt will be done, is that innovation towards how we make provision access accessible locally, um, how we give student choice in being able to stay at home but still being able to access provision, access education, um, and then how we make sure we prioritise campus for people who really need it um, for, you know, reasons of digital poverty, um, for, for other reasons, for, for marginalised students, for students in liberation communities, etc. Um, for example, for LGBTQ plus students who uh, might be from homophobic or transphobic households who need to move. Um, for black students who live uh, disproportionately in overcrowded households who might need to move because their home environment isn't conducive to education. Do you know what I mean? There's, there's lots of reason people might need to move but how do we start mapping out those students who most need campus figure out an actual an actual capacity for campus not one that ends up resulting in hundreds of students being locked down in the same building and claiming that hundreds of students are part of one household um, and, and then actually do what's best uh, for students but also for staff and communities because that's that's the only thing I'm interested in doing that's the only conversation I'm interested in having but it's not the one that the government are interested in having and that's that is really infuriating. Yeah I can I I definitely feel the the, the frustration um it's incredibly infuriating to hear that you know that you've been having these conversations I know I have and I'm sure lots and lots of people have across the country um I think you know we we all kind of we saw this coming um and that's kind of what's so frustrating about it is that it's this is a preventable crisis that we're in um it could have been stopped um we could have done things um and that that kind of that model of education that you were talking about of local hubs is so kind of it almost feels revolutionary and it really shouldn't because it's something that we should be doing. It, it would be so easy to do. Um, and you're so right, the fact that it is the marketized system that has caused this. Um, 
and that that is fundamentally the problem that's why universities aren't collaborating that's why we don't have that that's why we've had students you know locked in their halls that's why we've got these rent strikes going on um so well, i'm just going to kind of move on a little bit because i'm aware we're slowly running out of time um and there's so much um, <laughs> that i want to ask you about and it's so difficult to kind of pick the right things um and i know that we're probably not going to cover everything but that's fine um so we've been talking about the marketized system a little bit um and what do you think is kind of the government realization of the fact that they are almost the ones that have caused this they're the ones that have created this marketized system and pushed it on universities and pushed it forward with with the nss with tef with things like that um with taking away their funding with pushing them towards recruiting more and more students do you think the government is kind of coming to a point of realizing that um and kind of where do you see the landscape going in the next kind of couple of months and the couple of years um, of, of higher education and how that marketized system might get worse and at best, hopefully, get better? Asking me, do I think government is recognizing <laughs> the issues? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because it's an ideological challenge, right? It's not um, that, you know, it's not that we're putting facts and figures to them and they're like, oh, we can't see it. It's that they actually fundamentally um, do not believe it in the concept of, of free and accessible and lifelong education. They don't believe that that's something that's conducive to their inevitable aims, right? So before you even get to the like, this is this is the, this is the facts, this is the statistics, this is who's missing out, this is this, this is that. Like they're already closed off. They already is, is done. <laughs> like, where do we go from here? Um, and so that's why, um, as I was talking about in the opening, our real focus is, is mass movement building because rather than seeing power as this thing where you know you've got the people at the top who you need to convince and, and the pyramid of people at the bottom we're flipping that on its head and saying like if we if we amass enough uh, critical power on the ground at the grassroots with enough students um, empowered to stand up for their rights to stand up for the things that they deserve that they want um then then they can't stop us, right? Like it's it's about us taking it rather than expecting to be given um, this this uh, you know from 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 top down given this a new vision for education. No, we're gonna build it ourselves, um, and they're gonna wish they came along with the journey for us. And actually, that's happened historically throughout the history of the student movement. The student movement was talking about the NHS decades before it came into existence decades before like let's be real students are always at a cusp of what's coming and I don't, I don't know why people in society don't just buck up and get behind us because at every stage at literally every critical juncture in the history of this country uh, for the past century literally NUS is 98 years old students have been ahead of the curve um so it's a bit exhausting that people don't just realize by now like people's memories are short you know life is ridiculous um but we move, like we're gonna keep doing it um, and keep doing it and keep doing it. Um, and you know, my only hope is that, you know, when when I'm no longer a student uh, and I'm maybe doing something else and um, in a different space, I can look back and be like, actually, then the students know what they're talking about and, and get behind them. Um, and so I think just using that mentality and carrying it out throughout life is, is also gonna be um, something that I take with me from the student movement because you know, before I started this role, I really didn't know how, like that has literally been at every stage that like, students have just been ahead of the game. Um, and so it's, it is, in being in that in that position collectively is exhausting because you're constantly fighting people to when you can see it's like the next logical thing it's like come on guys like get with us but we, we just have to build it amongst ourselves and, and that's why i think the spaces for political education are more important than ever um because that's how we're going to turn the tide it's through the kind of mass organizing it's through giving people the access to the language the narrative and um, the things that they they're never going to give us because it's it's contrary to their 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 aims and to their objectives um so i hope that answers the question to some degree but yeah fundamentally they know but they don't care because they're ideologically opposed um to the very concepts um that we're we're building Oh yeah, I completely agree. That was an amazing answer. Thank you so much, Larissa. Um, so inspiring. Um, and I think you're you're dead right about the student movement. Um, they're they're 
so so ahead i know i've been we've worked warning universities about things back in like march um and they still haven't acted on them um and funnily enough uh, one of them is going to be the next question um and i'm going to turn on to my favorite subject um which is postgrads um sorry everyone i can't go through any of them without doing a postgrad question apologies i'm a postgrad sab so it comes naturally um <laughs> so uh, i've been talking with my institution about this for ages um and extensions uh for pgr students um, UKRI just kind of a couple of hours ago uh, put out a big announcement about extensions for students, but it doesn't cover everyone. Um, and PGRs are, are students that tend to fall down the gaps a little bit. Um, they don't necessarily have representation within the NUS or UCU. They kind of get a little bit forgotten sometimes. Um, so I think we're just wondering kind of what is, where would you see PGRs falling a little bit? Um, and is the NUS planning to do any work on this? Um, and, you know, in collaboration with UCU, because obviously they're, they're, they're cross boundary as students, um, because it is, it's a huge issue for students. Um, and I'm gonna stop talking now about that and let you answer, because I will talk about postgrads forever. <laughs> This is a massive, massive thing that we've actually, we've actually got a conversation with UCU about this in the next couple of weeks. Um, because rather than uh, PGRs feeling like they're represented by neither, we really tangibly want them to feel like they're represented by both. Um, and so we've, we've been very lucky to work closely with UCU for, on a number of things over the last couple of months. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, that's literally a conversation we've got in the pipeline um, about how we, you know, action, making sure that PGRs feel represented by both of us um, and that we're working together in, in that campaigning work and um, often that stuff as I say like we're building behind the scenes um, to make that possible because you know we for a long time that's been the case where PGRs just feel as you say invisibilized erased from the narrative um, and right now we're seeing PGRs often um, bear the brunt of you know the ways that the ways that the university is fundamentally just be like literally um, putting students who need, <laughs> literally need space the most. And when we're talking about like in-person teaching and access to like things in person, like PGRs are amongst the people who, who often need those resources, things on campus, um, you know, they, they actually need them um, to deliver um, their, their learning. And that this, it's just not gonna happen um, unless universities start recognizing that. And of course that means us and UCU working together. So um, as I say, that's a conversation in the pipeline. So there's not so much I can say about it right now. Um, but yeah, I was, I was really glad to, to be in touch with Joe and, and folks at UCU about that quite recently. Um, and yeah, so hopefully there's stuff on the horizon for that. Um, and I'm just thinking in terms of, and I think postgrads generally um, have been quite erased over the past couple of months. Um, and, you know, we've seen, um, you know, for PGs who teach the, the kind of ways that the, the precarity of the university has directly impacted them. Um, and, you know, there's no way that we can, we can mount against this without working with UCU. Like, I see that as fundamental to the mission of what we're doing. Um, you know, I was saying before that, that for me, it's the, the, everything is through the lens of students, staff and communities. Um, but, you know, UCU, but as well as well as UCU, so I'm trying to say is Unite, Unison and the other um, campus, campus um, unions, because I think there's been a lot of focus and, and not on postgrads. I think there needs to be more focus on postgrads, but I think there's been a lot of focus on academic staff on campuses and not enough on you know non-academic staff and what they're going through and the fact that the the university right now is often for, particularly for those um who are not in-house um being very callous in the way that it treats workers um you know particularly like yesterday even um i was chatting to folks at sussex who were seeing the catering staff there um completely axed off uh, in many ways um this is uh, but this is something that's being repeated up and down the country so as well as that piece of working together with UCU around PGRs, um, we're also hoping to, to work more closely with a lot of the other campus unions to, to make sure that we're being really holistic um, in our campaigns. And when we're saying that students deserve better, we know that that's in inextricably linked uh, to the condition, not only of students who teach and, and students who, who hold those, those staff uh, roles, but also um, other um, um, other staff, both academic and non-academic. Um, so sorry, that's a bit of a roundabout way to say we've got stuff in the pipeline, stuff on the horizon, and I'm really hoping to do more on that soon. 
That's amazing. Thank you, Larissa. It's it's really great to hear that that you guys are starting to consider postgrads. I know it's something that's very close to my heart. Um, I work at one of the two postgrad student unions in the country, um, so it's something I talk about all the time. Um, but I'm not going to do that now because I know that it is not 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 the main thing that we're here to talk about. Um, instead, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on because um, we're kind of approaching our last ten minutes. Um, so I'm going to to move on to kind of what what actions we can be taking. Um, and what we can be doing and how we build this, this student movement that can really kind of shape the change and shape the narrative and, and how do we how do we change our institutions? Um, and I think so we've obviously, we've talked a little bit about the government um, and how kind of in inaccessible they are and how they really don't see that there is anything that needs changing because the education system is kind of what they want and it perpetuates the injustices that they, they don't want to see. Um, so, the government isn't the only place though that really has that power and obviously the universities themselves are kind of incumbent to to the the marketization system but they do have power vice chancellors can change things they have their you know their lobbying group uk um and what what kind of what power do you think there is in institutions um that students can use and how students can make their voices heard there but also to the government as well yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Where does student power lie, right? That's literally, that's the crux of everything that I, that I do and that I hope to do. And, um, so yeah, I think, you know, we're seeing with the student rent strikes, people really hit the, the power of these universities in their role as mega landlords, which I think is really, really powerful. Um, I think uh, as well as that, we've seen kind of um, over the past few years, um, the kind of um, divestment campaigns and decolonial activity, um, looking at universities through the lens of these like massive, massive businesses uh, and really taking on um, their, their economic infrastructure uh, and seeing that as a lever of power um, and really challenging, um, you know, their, their PR, their PR um, interests around that. Um, because of course, um, you know, tied to, the, to the, the impacts of marketization is this obsession with uh, how universities look and feel and their, their like PR um, cleanliness. And once you attack that, um, you really do attack the heart of power in these institutions, which is sad to say, but sometimes you've got to do it. Um, I think there's this this additional power um, that students can definitely tap into around um, holding VCs feet to the fire. And I don't think vice chancellors get enough heat, um, particularly because they're, they're collecting these massive paychecks, hundreds of thousands of pounds in many cases. Meanwhile, like literally laying off um, precarious workers um, who are literally doing the work uh, and filling so many of the gaps that the institution is leaving, particularly when it comes um, to students' mental health and, and checking in and being um, th th those pastoral um, support mechanisms for students in many cases, doing that extra unpaid labor. And that's always disproportionately um, women and women of color in those roles doing that work as well. Um, so I think there's there's definitely some power in challenging vice chancellors and really holding their feet to the fire. Um, which I guess leads me really nicely onto the work that we're doing on Tuesday, because that's literally what we're trying to do with these town halls. We're trying to say, look, you don't get to sit in your ivory tower and make decisions without being held to account by the people that you're supposedly making them on behalf of or for. Um, so, you know, that's, you're going to have to come around the table and listen to what we're actually experiencing and listen to our demands uh, and be accountable. Um, so I'd say if people immediately want to get involved, then like literally it's a bit of a free for all. Like anyone who wants to run a town hall can um like just literally drop me a message so i'll put my email in the chat um there's a toolkit and stuff that we've produced but other than that it's like it's just very chilled like i'm like anyone do what you want with students to do better like it's your campaign like we created the banner for people but like it's your campaign it belongs to the grassroots like i'm not i'm not prescriptive over what things look like um and then in the long term we're really trying to um in, in terms of building student power um, actually create and, and regularize spaces where students are coming together um, to think about what this campaign looks like long term because as, as I say I think for me the focus is really about you know empowering students um, as opposed to you know playing into the institution and, and trying to um, you know I think it's seeing uh, students built up as the the agents of change and what that looks like in a mass sense and so like the focus for me is really 
um, how do we build like regular spaces for organizing? So um, NUS USI, which represents students in Northern Ireland, um, has set up an action group. Um, so students in Northern Ireland are meeting weekly around students deserve better and really building that campaign into the future and spending a lot of that time talking about um, how they build the case for free education, which is really, really exciting. Um, and, and, you know, we're looking at the moment for regional reps um, for England. Um, I don't want to call it an England act action group because that just sounds really fascist, but I don't know what else to call it, which is kind of the only reason we haven't started it yet, because um, I just don't know what to call it, guys. Someone help me. Someone in the chat, if you've got a better idea, just let me know. Um, <laughs> so a non-fascist England action group is what we're looking to set up with some sort of other name. I don't know. Um, but yeah, that is in the works. Um, South of Scotland, I'm screaming. I might actually do that. Um, but yeah, so we're looking for regional reps for the campaign um, who are on the ground, who are just looking to um, get involved, shape the campaign, meet regularly, and figure out where we take this. Um, because, you know, we're looking to do things like rallies, we're looking to do things um, that continue to like get students out, get students active, um, get them empowered, get them with access to spaces for political education. So if you're looking to do stuff like that, please jump in like we're, yeah, we're always looking for folks who are looking to organize. Um, West Netherlands Action Group, this is actually too much. Um, and then, yeah, I guess it's just what, like, we're at the moment literally planning for how we create those political education spaces next term, which is really exciting. I won't give too much away, but um, I think it's going to be really, really cool. Um, and, you know, it really about like driving power in and amongst students. Because um, I think we, we can spend like, or NUS has spent in, in the past a lot of time lobbying and a lot of time, you know, and, and you know, that has its space and that is necessary and we continue to do that. Um, but we're kind of reoriented towards being this campaigning organization that is that is trying to get people active and that gives people those tools and stuff and doing this kind of stuff and like literally I'm doing this all day every day like it's very exciting I'm um, actually getting to talk to you folks and um, yeah so I think just seeing that as the focus and seeing that as the lens through which we want to derive um, the student movement um, and, you know, spending less energy on people who, as I say, are just ideologically opposed to everything that we want to do um, so that we can build that critical mass um, that makes the difference in the long term. That's amazing, Larissa. And it sounds like there's so many great opportunities to get involved um, and to, to do things and to really kind of to build this movement. Um, and that was definitely a call out for any of our creative minds here to come up with with names for what well, anti-fascist names um, that we call this this group. Uh, uh, we've already got some great suggestions uh, in the chat. I'm not sure that we've got time for another question. I'm going to wait is Rosie, Rosie's nodding at me that we've got time for one final question. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch up a little bit and kind of still on the lines of how, how are we building this kind of this movement and this radical change? Um, obviously we're all here from the Green Party um, as, as we all know, um, but what is, what place and what role do you think the Green Party and the, the Young Greens in particular can pay and kind of play? And not, Gosh, we've got to the end of this. This <laughs> we've got to the end of it now, and my brain stopped working. What role do you think the Young Greens and the Green Party can play, not pay, um, in in building and supporting this really strong student movement? That's an exciting question. Okay, so I mean, almost I'm almost like you guys tell me because like you lots know you best, right? Um, so I might flip that around on you in a second. Um, but fundamentally, uh, you know, when, when we're talking about organizing, like, I think this, this, the student movement has always been um, across different, you know, different <laughs> intra ideologies. And, do you know what I mean? Like it's, it's never been about like this party or that party. Um, so I think it's, it's really powerful um, to bring together our folks from Young Greens, folks from no political party, folks, do you know what I mean? Um, and to see those different lenses come together to build something that's really radical and really incredible. Um, so first of all, I just say like, please get involved, like get stuck in with students as are better. Um, but also get stuck in with our decolonization work, which is the other kind of um, major national um, campaign that we're running for the next two years. Um, so yeah, those are, those I guess are the um, that's the starting point for me. Um, but in terms of the Green Party, um, I think 
the Greens have always brought like a radical lens to the political narrative of the day, right? And I think that there is definitely um, a role for um, the, between the student movement and the Greens to play in, you know, really shaping the political narrative in a direction um, that is much different than what most of the, the public is consuming at, at the moment. And so I don't know, I think that that's exciting to me that we might be able to work together a bit more to, to do that. Currently, I mean, I don't know what those routes are, how we do that, how we make that happen. Um, but I think I think it's an exciting premise um, from which to start some conversations because, you know, that like, like we've seen that historically, like the Greens um, have always like, they can I swear? Um, but they've been shaking shit up for time. Like, um, do you know what I mean? So let's, let's shake shit up together. Like I'm down to do that. Um, yeah I'm definitely up for for shaking some shit up um that sounds amazing um I know that uh, the green students committee which met on Monday um and that uh, Billy who's the other co convener who's also here we chair and we've been talking about how how do we get involved and help support your uh, students deserve better campaign and on the day of action and everything um so we're 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 planning things um and we'll be uh, hopefully getting more involved with that um but it all sounds so exciting um I think we're going to finish there because uh, it's like one minute to nine um but before I hand over to Rose for kind of ending um thank you so much Larissa for joining us um it's been an incredibly inspiring evening we've heard such a range of things around the injustices in in the system around where they've come from around how how the government just you know isn't really cut out for dealing with it and doesn't really want to um and how how we we make that change and how we build that really from the grassroots um so it's been it's been an amazing evening um thank you so much for joining us Larissa um it's been incredible to have you here um and I hope that we we're all inspired now to get involved with the student movement and start kind of building that change um and making making things happen and shaking some shit up um I think that's that's a good way to <laughs> go um, no, I'm gonna hand over to me yeah awesome um I'm gonna hand over to Rosie now uh, for some very final things uh, thank you so much Larissa um that was brilliant as everyone's been saying there's so much great feedback in the chat I'm glad you all enjoyed it as much as I did and yeah as Jane has been saying and Billy they've been like we've been working hard um, moving forward on like really focusing in on education over the coming months. I think during the kind of exam scandal we mentioned that we had a talk um, just last week with Vix Lothian, our education spokesperson, who was even here on the call with us tonight, which is great. So welcome Vix. Um, talking about school closures and we didn't realise that I think uh, um, almost until kind of the summer when we realised maybe the Green Party were the only ones um, in terms of political parties that were calling for a U-turn on the um, algorithms and calling for CAG usage and we were like actually you know what we have such a role to play as part of a kind of a wider movement in backing the NUS and being that kind of political voice so we're really excited to be delivering on this and we've got ideas for how our members you guys can get involved coming up but we've also been working and speaking with um, the rent strikers in Manchester and Bristol and hope to have them come on to a call coming up soon talking about how we can actually like hearing their story but also how you can proactively get involved and learn these skills yourselves if you're at university as well struggling under these like um, circumstances that we've heard of um, and we're also going to be um, delivering as you can see the start of this is the kind of the prequel to a, a new series of online political education talks that Larissa spoke about is, is such an important part of um, and at this time really understanding what is happening in the world right now what are the structures underpinning it and how do we challenge them so um, please do tune in 